Well, hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of CISO Talk. Now, this is a little bit different edition of CISO Talk. It's actually our new format and uh, also with new co-host, Jennifer J.J. Manila. How are you doing, Jennifer? I'm great. Awesome. So happy to be doing this with you. We, we've actually recorded one. This is our second uh, edition, actually our first guest that we've had on. So we're, uh, we're together with you and I, but CISO Talk's been going on for a couple of years now. So we've got a real great library of content. Um, JJ, anything you want to do to, to kind of kick us off here? I, and then we'd need to introduce Dan too, if you want to take the next step. Yeah, I'm all in for that. So sure. So yeah, I've known Dan, Mr. Dan Glass here for, I don't know, 10, not as long as I've known you, Mitch, but close. close. Uh, and I met Dan, you know, back, he was a CISO at, uh, American or one of the airlines at that point in time and has been CISOs different places and the CISO at NTT now. Um, and throughout that time, we've uh, crossed paths at B-sides and conferences and just in the community. And he's always had something interesting to say. He's always just been a pure entertainment and a wealth of knowledge. So I thought, what a great first guest. Welcome, Dan. Thank <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. King, King or Jester? Um, <laughs> <laughs> a bit of both. Uh, well, tell um, us a little bit about your background. JJ you did a great job of where you've intersected and you know, yeah. tell us about your CISO experience. So yeah, I've been uh I've been in chair for uh over 10 years now. So um that's where the I you know at, at one point uh I was clean shaven and had no gray hair. Um, but as as time passes, uh you know, I the rest of it is just for gray or just for men, the gray stuff mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so I've been in chair for 10 years. Uh, American Airlines uh, was was my probably my most famous stint. I was out there more. Uh, now I'm one of uh, several kajillion, um, I think, uh, CISOs that we have in NTT. Uh, it's a huge company, you know, hundreds of operating companies within the NTT family. So for people in the U.S. that may not know NTT, it's it's the Japanese AT&T, if you, you know, for for want of a better uh, analogy. And uh, and just like AT&T uh, went to diversify its portfolio, NTT is doing the same. And so I'm working one of the companies in that diversification, which is North America, America you know, and the U.S. Uh, specifically in services. Um, and my my role now is uh, I'm. Mostly corporate uh, side of the uh, CISO, but uh, more and more I keep getting drawn in uh, to the client side because, as everybody knows, the intersection between service providing and uh, the things that provide that service, that back end stuff, uh, they've they've melded right. So corporate systems become client facing systems in some cases. Uh, you know, our laptops and and things like that. So. Uh, I'm constantly getting drawn in uh, on the client side as well. So it's a, it's an interesting job. And, and as I tell people, it's punishment for how I treated my service providers when I was in chair at American. So I'm, I'm now, I'm now suffering the good graces of that. <laughs> well, we're going to start off. There's some things that both JJ and I want to get into with you, but we're going to start off with our what's bugging you topic or, or segment, kind of a new idea we're trying out here. So um, I could go first, but I'm, I'm going to offer it to one or both of you, whoever wants to jump in. What's bugging you? I, I think Dan's especially ranty today. So I think we let's wind him up and let him go first. <laughs> Just today. Oh, you should have seen How's yesterday. <laughs> um, there's, boy, the, the list is long. Um, so... So I think today, you know, seeing the, the some of my frustration when I when I see uh, like what's going on at LastPass, uh, once again, more details come out, uh, you know, and and it was a DevOps engineer uh, with a BYO, you know, doing work from home and and, you know, within our company. And I'm sure every CISO that listens to this podcast is going to probably not in agreement if they have any sort of, of uh, you know, next gen DevOps cloud type engineers is that they demand a lot of freedom on their systems. But with that freedom comes a lot of responsibility because, you know, my stuff breaks them, right? Uh, if I have a sassy tool that gets in the way of, you know, doing Docker and things like that, um, you know, then I, I either have choice, I tell them don't do Docker, which obviously isn't going to work in a service provider uh, arena or in pretty much any company now, uh, or I have to lower the barrier so somewhat to allow... Uh, that application and others like it uh, to go unfettered. So that's 
that's top of mind. Um, and you know, and so, so now seeing last pass sort of getting pantsed over and over again, over, you know, what's going on there. It's, it's, I feel for them because I, I know that they are great people, but you know, honestly, uh, this is a security product, it's critical infrastructure. And we, you know, we, as a community security folks, you know, we need to be doing better, uh, by, by forcing the business to align to the pro, you know, they say, uh, you know, don't get hacked, but then they do everything in their power. It seems to to get hacked. <laughs> Victim of their own. I'll leave it at one device. because my goodness, we can go. Oh, there's two. I, and I have a question about that because I, I saw the announcement from today, and um, full disclosure, that has been a a really fun part of my morning this morning uh, okay. because there's some some that's part of my life still. Um, so, and I'm curious to ask you guys, because because Dan, obviously you've managed these these programs and projects and Mitch, you work a lot on, on that side. So one of the fun things is I came from the networking side and security and, and Mitch came from, from the other side with software and application development. So, you know, my question looking at this is somebody who, you know, one of the things I do is volunteer with Cloud Security Alliance on the Zero Trust stuff. I am not a, I am not, we've talked about this. I'm not a cloud native person. I'm learning. Um, I don't do any type of software development because I stopped programming at QBasic, um, not my thing. But looking at this and saying, okay, we have the tools now to do things like container segmentation, secrets management, brokered access. I assumed that companies of this size, and certainly a company who was in charge of securing other people's stuff with that level of trust, would have already moved to these models and had these things in place. So for those of us that are sitting back here, not educated on how this works behind the scenes, where where did this get off the rails? Or was it started off the rails and, and nobody got it back on, the, nobody put it on the rails in time? Well, I'm, I'm going to interject because I would definitely hear what you have to say, Dan. I think one of the wild card factor is, it's kind of like working in a university, right? The professors and the researchers are kings and queens. They kind of get what they want. In the world of developers, they view their world that much that way pretty much too. And they'd like to be able to download whatever open source or I'm not making jest of it. It's just that that's kind of the, the, the mantra. And, and, you know, just like I want to have my Docker, I want to have this tool, I want to have that. They aren't necessarily security savvy or fully fully up to speed on things you're talking about. So we ran it, went into this chasm of our security and software teams filling the gap in whatever way they work together or not to do that. And I think that's a lot of the a lot of changes happening out of the control of the security team, but it's going to happen anyway. And you have to figure out how you're going to work that. And Dan, you can tell me, yeah, you're full of crap, Mitch. They shouldn't be doing all that. Oh, you're and full of crap, Mitch. Uh, <laughs> no. No, you're 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 right, but you know. So the I think the biggest struggle that we have, um, you know, and this once again, this goes back to you know what the incentives are, right? This is always incentive management, and then I'll get to the bo more boring part. But incentives are somewhat in more interesting than the final point I'll make. Uh, the incentives for the business is to make money, right? And if you have a developer saying that, well. For me to do it the way security is saying it takes me six hours, but if I just do it on my own laptop, it takes me 30 minutes. That's an exaggeration, of course. Um, uh, in, in reality, so most of the time, as I already mentioned, they can't even do it with the security stuff. So six hours is even out the window because it's broken. Um, so that's that's part of the problem is the technology that uh, that so, so the security technology stack is a little bit behind where IT is, right? And and I know that some people are probably shouting at their phones or however the, you know, in their cars um, right now saying, yes, there's solutions. Well, this comes up to the my second point, which is this stuff's expensive. The the apps that uh that protect our stuff, secrets management. I can't tell you the name of the vendor and I won't go into details, but I was gobsmacked and floored when I got the quote back for you know X amount of seats. And you know, I asked about volume licensing and you know, do you know how big our entire company is? And I have reach into the entire, you know, to Japan and the entire, you know, 200 something, you know, 50,000 employees at NTT and, and they didn't budge. It wasn't not even a penny, you know, and then, then, and no future discounts. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm glad you're so proud of your product, but I, I've got to walk away at this point. I'm going to go find somebody else that's doing it. Maybe not as well. Right. Um, and that, and that happens almost in every segment of cybersecurity, right? So if you're a, 
a smaller company, a mom and pop shop or, or uh, a school or uh, even a mid-sized business, you, you know, if your if your IT department is making revenue of, you know, let's say $10 million, but you have, you know, your security costs alone are two, um, to once again, 20%, uh, you know, you just ate up all the margin, right? And I'm not, you know, once again, I, I, I'm the CISO, right? I get it. And I'm here, the one, I'm the one putting together that bill of materials and I'm the one that's presenting it to get approved. So I'm all in line with it, but I understand the struggles, um, uh, especially when the the business doesn't even know that that application may prove, prove to be valuable. And I'm sitting here going, but GDPR and data, you know, and, and uh, authentication, authorization and two factor and all this stuff that I have to layer on top of it before they even know it's going to make money. And, and that becomes a problem. And so that's why I mentioned before these security companies that barrel forward. I also have sympathy for them because they have to make those decisions of, well, we're not doing it right, but we can't do it right until we make some more money. And so let's go, right? Do you I think it, it's fair to say, though, that they're going to, you know, a company that's had this type of breach re- repeatedly and then what happened today yeah. um, is going to suffer more revenue loss from that market share loss than it would have cost they said, I think only four people, only four developers had the keys to the kingdom. If nothing else, would you not at least have identified that in the risk model and put paid the hundred dollars a year for the four people to have something? Absolutely. No, you're, okay. you're absolutely right. But, you know, and I'm and I'm a large enterprise kind of expert, you know, specialist expert. I'm, <laughs> I can tell you what I am an expert in, but it ain't this. Um, <laughs> but but uh Yes. Mergers totally, and acquisitions. It's mergers yeah, and acquisitions. Well, you know, in a large company, those four people, I'd have, still have to put them through procurement and we'd still have to, and then they would get mad at that price and they would want discounts and we'd still get stuck. Uh, like I said, I can, I can rant and rave about any subject. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a walking uh, angry o meter. Um, but, but honestly, yes, you're absolutely right. For a smaller company that can uh, that, that can get past all of that, right. They don't have HR and, and, procurement departments and, you know, there's just like, you know, a hundred people and they're all just gearing towards that hockey stick of growth. Yes. They absolutely should be buying four licenses into that product. They should be trying to work with, you know, a, uh, an, you know, a, a next gen AV uh, vendor to get better protection for those folks. Maybe not for Madge that works the front desk, although I think you should too. But for the four people, for the kings of the kingdom, the people that have, you know, any kind of directory access, whether you're using a cloud based IDM system or or on premise, like an active directory, it doesn't matter. You you need to protect those people first. Right. Not. Yes. Executives need to be protected, too. Kind of, I guess. Right. But marketing secrets isn't really going to put you out of business right now. It's really going to be this kind of thing, Um, you know, or at least. It's going to erase your revenue, lower trust, and get your uh, your owners in the form of venture capital uh, antsy, right? And you don't want them antsy when you're going to for your next round. So I hear. So to raise capital in that environment, no yeah. doubt. When you you've had that much exposure. Sorry, go ahead, JJ. Oh, that's okay. I was going to say. So I think this this is an interesting way to look at it. Um, because one of the questions I, I we get asked a lot on the zero trust side is. Well, this all looks complex because most of the guidance for zero trust is is geared for federal agencies. So obviously, this is something that's doable for a large organization, and it's not doable for a small, an SMB, a startup. So is it fair to assume that a startup or a smaller company is going to have a better shot at securing their assets? Yeah, I I think that... I don't think it's fair to say that an SMB or a smaller company could couldn't do zero trust. I, I think they could. It's because zero trust is an architecture. It's not a product, right? It's not even a series of product. It is pure architecture. And so, really looking at how you're designing your your architecture, and some companies may not even know that they have an architecture. But you know, if you're if you have systems and they connect to each other, you have an architecture, right? I hate to tell you that. So. In order for for zero trust to be implemented in those places, once again, you, you really need to look at smart product. You need to try to utilize all of the features within certain products, right? Because there's uh, a lot of people buy the Ferrari for the front right hubcap, 
right? And that may not be the best way to, to that's not that's not always the best use of your money, right? You or the little badge, right? Isn't yeah, that what- <laughs> exactly, right? I want the keychain that comes with the Ferrari, but they don't sell it individually. So I bought the Ferrari because I really like that keychain. <laughs> But it happens all the time, right? There, and 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 that's why some of this stuff is so expensive because it can be because a lot of companies pay that money and then don't use the features. So then they go do business with another company to, uh, you know, the left hand doesn't talk to the right hand. So especially in these smaller companies where, you know, you have fewer people making these decisions, it may be even easier. Uh, but once again, you you need to be smart about it. You know, so using cloud based off whether that's using uh, you know a Microsoft uh, Azure uh, AD or it's using an Okta you know they have those SMB packages they're not I wouldn't say they're cheap but they're not like at the enterprise package either right you get less features but you can do zero trust with it because you don't zero trust need is, a lot of those features right in small yeah things. yeah you don't need a lot of those features because you can profiles. use them anyway exactly right so zero trust is really it starts with the identity the identity of the device the identity of the person using the device and the identity of the application or service or API or whatever you're trying to use, right? And it's just validating the trust over and over, you know, making sure things are the way they are. And so, or, or who they are supposed to be, you know, so certification is important, but but there's ways to do it. And, you, and there are ways to do it. You can be creative, like using IP address blocks. If you're going through a SASE product, only trusting coming from your SASE product IP addresses, that's a great way to ensure. And, and then making sure that your SASE product is locked down to the point where only people that, uh, you know, or the only way it's deployed is on your devices, right? And having a way to to certify that, right? So, well, now you've just created a zero trust sort of envelope between, you know, like, let's say your email system that has that protection in place that it can only come from, you know, your, the block that you use from your SASE product all the way through your device, right? And then you do the same thing with using MFA, if you can afford MFA, if you can't, then 2FA, because a lot of 2FA is now baked into the systems just for free, right? And the apps to download the, the codes are free. And, you know, if you want to get fancy, get with push and that's better. Um, but, you know, start somewhere. Don't use text messaging. Nobody use text messaging. <laughs> use, a, <laughs> use, use the OTPs okay. or, or, uh, um, or push if you can afford it once again. And a lot of those systems like, you know, Azure, you know, if you buy that, that product suite, you, it comes with it. So use it, right? You don't need another product to layer on top of it. Just utilize what you have. And, and once again, and that's and 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 we can iterate on that, right? You just iterate on that and you always you step through and say, okay, so how are people getting access to this? How are they getting access to that? And you just validate each step of the way. And it, once again, you don't need to have, you know, a huge security budget and you don't need a large security team in order to get this done. You just need to be thoughtful about how you design not just the security, but IT. Right. And that's the biggest, I think that's probably the biggest point I can make on that. It's the partnership between security and IT. Because if you're trying to bolt this stuff on after IT has built it, no way. The zero trust can't happen in that, you know, with, with that going on. Yeah, I described that as you don't wait till the car rolls off the assembly line to say, we'd really like to have some airbags on this now. Yeah. How do we do that? Well, that's going to be a damn ugly car. I'll tell you that. No Ferrari for sure. Nope. <laughs> Little duct tape. Some <laughs> wire will be looking good. <laughs> so you've seen my car. <laughs> yes, I see it in the background there. <laughs> uh, I'm curious too. So say some more about the security budget versus the IT budget. I mean, how should we, how should IT security be working together, planning together, coordinating, or do they kind of leave the table and kind of go do their respective stuff? How, what do you think that intersection, that Venn diagram looks like? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, and I think every company is a little different. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of the answer to that is in the form of human being, because uh, there's a lot of ego. Right. And there's a lot of uh, empire building, nation building, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I'm not trying to call people out and security people can be just as bad as the IT people. But but people get their domains and they they're very protective of them. So identity is a great example where HR, you know, is in the room. IT is in the room and security and some companies is still not in the room. Right. Uh, and or they're they're knocking at the door and, and sometimes IT is letting them in. Sometimes they're not. Um, so I, I do think that IT and security um, need to work very closely together to understand 
you know, what makes sense for that company. Now I'm, I'm a, more akin to the big CISO role versus the small CISO role. This, you know, and, and what I mean by that, and that's not to mean big and small is important or not important, but, but the, the CISOs, CISOs, <laughs> I don't know how people say it. Um, we in in the people that have my job title, uh, I we have governance, right? So we do audits, internal. You know, we create all of the administrative processes and all that good stuff, right? That you know the policies, which I know everybody reads, um, and it, you know, but we may not manage a lot of technology, right? You know, maybe we get involved with security operations and you know, and monitoring and and response and recovery. Um, but we're we're not really in the uh, protect part, right? If you're in this CF, CSF nerd like me, um, and and I think that you know, looking at the NIST CSF, they're pretty clear in there what they think, right? They think security should have own identity. They you know because it's in there it's in several points. Um, you know they they're you know we should own portions of desktop management, um, you know, and network management, not just because you can't. You know, and JJ, I hope you'll nod with me, but it's it's getting increasingly difficult to segment network away from network security, right? Because um, it used to be that the network team had the routes and they had the switches and routers and they had their WAN, and then we would slap a firewall in front of it, you know, and you know, pat ourselves on the back and 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 go get a beer. Um, now it's a lot harder, right? Because the not just I mean we we can still do that but it's way more expensive and once again you're buying the Ferrari when you're only wanting the keychain um, because every product whether it's Palo whether it's Cisco you know they're, uh, Juniper they're all baking security into the core platforms now which we've been begging for forever but now that they did that now the network team has all this security stuff on their systems and then we're demanding that we need to manage it so once again I don't know what makes sense for your company or somebody else's company. But in some cases, it does belong with network and it should. And in other cases where like maybe they're cloud heavy, maybe security runs that. Maybe, you know, if you're if you're mostly work from home and you're, the majority of stuff is in the cloud, well, then your SASE product is handling probably the majority of your DNS. It's handling the majority of your routing. It's handling, you know, 100 percent of your uh, access control. Right. And, 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 and policies going out to the systems. So maybe that is a security decision. Um, you know, the same can be said for uh, security uh, endpoint management, where security owns an endpoint management tool that IT can then use. And, you know, so security becomes a service provider to IT and IT can log in and do the patching. Right. We don't own the patching. I, I, and personally, I do the same thing. I do it. I do that with configuration management uh, and patch management, as well as vulnerability management. So I own I own the budget. I own the the infrastructure, so to speak, whether it's cloud-based or on-prem, doesn't matter to me um, for those products. But I have, uh, but I have, I've made every incentive uh, out there for those individual application system infrastructure backend people, data center to go in to the uh, vulnerability management tool and see, you know, their systems. Make sure that their systems are theirs that we get from asset management, and then make sure. That those systems are patched, and if they're not, they know that they end up on a report that my team generates that goes in front of you know the big wigs in the company, and so they don't want to be on that list, and so they they patch their own systems, right? And there's a lot more in the background, and my team's working with them, and we schedule stuff, and we you know, but but at the end of the day, it's self service, but it's also accountable, right? And that's a I think that's a big part of it as well. And I have no idea what the question was that you asked originally, so. I think it was, was it self-service or is it, <laughs> that wasn't the question. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting yeah. No, I, way to think yeah, about like it. Yeah, like a latte with, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, JJ. <laughs> so we moved from tequila to lattes now. Yeah. Mm, okay. <clears throat> I was going to say, I think that's an interesting way to think. Oh, no, <laughs> I didn't go ahead, say please. what was in the coffee. <laughs> I hope it's not tequila because that. No, would not be tequila. Disgusting. No, 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 no. Well, it Irish, could be, Irish whiskey. It it could be whiskey. I would be okay yeah. with that. Irish whiskey. I That's think there's some opportunity for dark rum with the right coffee. Ooh, interesting. All right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll but not gin and not tequila. Those are hard nose. Oh God, no! Oh gin, I can't oh, God, even smell no. gin anymore. That's a different. <laughs> That's a different podcast, though, guys. There's a recovery program for that. That's, yeah. You know, 
<laughs> what is that RSA after hours? I was pump. just going to say, <laughs> it's been more than one <laughs> RSA trip with some bad gin, I'm sure. But anyway, all right. Right. I was going to say, I don't remember. I do remember. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting way to look at it. And I do think it's, it depends. I could argue both sides of that. So obviously, you know, coming in more from the networking side, but working in security heavily for, I don't know, 15 ish years at this point. Um, I think there are places where that might make sense where security has ownership over some of the operational systems, traditional operational systems. And then I've seen places where that has been attempted and failed miserably, probably because they don't have the communication and the trust between the teams, which is probably why I have a job because a lot of what I do is sit between a security group and, and an operations group and help them, you know, kumbaya. Um, but it's the challenging thing to me is that like these systems keep getting more and more complex. And so, you know, I've worked in networking on that side for probably close to 30, d- definitely over 20 years, definitely over 20. Years. Let's just not age myself any more than that. And it's been fun, fun and and terrifying watching it because, you know, when I first started doing that type of training, we, we did everything right. I, I, did switch route WAN infrastructures, firewalls, VPN, Wi-Fi when that came out. Um, it, all of it, anything that had an IP address and passed packets, we architected it, secured it, configured it, etc. And I think that was the that was how we grew up. And then hiring people in the past several years, it's been bizarre because everybody has these specialties because all of these systems, and I'm assuming the same thing has happened on the application development side, have gotten so much more complex. And so, whereas before you could learn, you know, basically three vendors equivalent of of switching and routing in in a week or two, now, you know, I'm I'm not, I'm, well, shoot, I'm just going to call it out. I don't know all of all of the different training programs from all of them, but you know, one of the Wi-Fi controller vendors who also make switches and other things, the training just for one of their controller operating systems, of which there are three out right now, is more than a two-week training. And that is just for that. That is not for any of the security and authentication stuff. It's not for like anything right related to radius it's not for anything related to what we need to do to segment on the wired environment and or do you know route WAN routing out of those things so it's like what you could learn in in a couple of weeks and i would say get really good with hands on in a few months now it takes you a few months just to learn how to configure this stuff and you know, I was having this conversation with a senior engineer recently. We always used to be able to troubleshoot. And now we can't because there's a 50-50 chance there's a product bug. And, and my question is, is if you start, if you take a seasoned network engineer with 20 and 30 years experience that can't figure things out because the product is too complex and there's bugs on top of it, how do we, and again, same thing with any of the other systems, right? This operational how do you then take something that com- complex and dump it into a team's lap who, who, I mean, frankly, a lot of the people that I've talked to and interviewed with for security positions don't know the OSI stack. They're really good at some of the networking people I've interviewed don't either. They're really good at what they're like. I know where to log into this thing and which buttons to click to make this thing happen in this product. And they don't understand the technology and the architecture. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. And that's why we drink, JJ. Nailed it. That's why we drink. <laughs> Back to my tequila. <laughs> it's, this is yeah. this is just ginger ale, I swear. <laughs> but anyway, that's okay. Well, so so oh my God. JJ, the, it, it this is, is a, this is a CISO. Oh, you can't oh there it is. CISO size cup. There you go. There you that's, go. That's the entry level CISO cup, right? You know, I, th- I think you can pick at any place in the architecture, whether it's cloud, whether it's um, identity, whether it's on prem, whether it's in the app, whether it's in sort of the infrastructure, the network, or, or embedded throughout it. The, the level of complexity is extremely high. And I think that's one of the reasons why it, it's almost like a school of fish. It's like, 
Yes, there's security throughout all of it, but there are holes in it. There are product bugs in it. There, there's always something because it's also all changing at the same time, right? None of it's really truly static. There's some pieces may stay that state for a while, but they eventually change too. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges I have getting my head around of around it is any one piece of it can change, not without us necessarily knowing, especially in a cloud or a SaaS or other kind of world. I'm wondering how you how you think about solving or just keeping your head around that problem, Dan. Um, sorry. Uh, I'll give you, I saved the easy question for you. Well, can <laughs> you... Can you rephrase it? I'm sorry. You were going to have to cut that. So there's a lot of complexity yeah. throughout the stack vertically and across the environments that we're in, whether it, yeah. you're thinking about a network and security yeah. application. Sorry. Yeah, no, I now I got it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, 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 kinda, I was right. following you and then you asked me the question and I was like, wait, what? Um, so I apologize <laughs> for that. No, the, the He's borrowing my blonde. That's right. I <laughs> pin that. Um, so, it's hard it, it, you, because we're we're not only having to keep up with what's going on in IT. We have, as JJ said, we have our own issues within that complexity, right? So, so it's this race, and, and like I said, the the security vendors haven't kept up with the the IT innovations, but they've had some amazing innovations themselves. And sometimes they're marked to market a little late, or we don't need it. You know, we we ask for it and ask for it and ask for it, and by the time it shows up, IT has moved on. Um, you know, and and I think. What we need to to have happen, you know, I, I don't think it's anything CISOs can do other than maybe through influence with some vendors, is we we need the DevOps community. And I love the DevOps community. I, I, I used to speak at DevOps days and, and, and participate. Um, I'm a big fan of it. I do believe it can lead to better security outcomes. But what we need is um, better, not just outreach to security, but we need... Uh, for those to be also considered sort of like what I mentioned before with like system management tools, traditionally seen as an IT product, I view it as a security product that IT can use. I think we need to maybe take the same approach with some of the, the stuff that's going on within DevOps. Uh, you know, Jenkins is a is a configuration management and deployment type system, right? Um, you know, why why couldn't security get their hands on that and use it? Um, maybe not be, once again, not be the 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 people who are uh, managing the system as far as you know making sure the deployments go out on time or and doing the scripting, but maybe they're the the sort of sponsors of that system and they manage the the ecosystem around it and the ins and outs of it. Um, because once again, now there's a different mindset around it. It's treated differently, or there's a little maybe a little bit more scrutiny on what's going on inside of that. Um, you know, same thing with. You know, sort of like I said before about network, right? When you are have a company that's working remotely and then may have some small offices, you know, with Wi-Fi uh, that they have lo- co-located, it may not make sense to have a, a network and a security team that are separated from each other because, uh, you know, there's not enough network to really carry. Now, other companies that have traditional data centers and WAN and, you know, and then office back, you know, back office environments, Obviously, they need a network team and the security team, you know, but that that complexity needs to be addressed with JJs. <laughs> Every company needs a JJ to sit between network and not, you know, and, and you know, security architects and or engineers uh, that are managing security product, the network team. And we got to get rid of the finger pointing and the, the flame throwing because that, you know, that's inevitable, but and but avoidable. Once again, if everybody sits down and goes through and creates maybe a R&R document, roles and responsibilities, or, you know, through project manager or RACI, right? Uh, the, the, the responsible, accountable, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then everybody will know what they're supposed to be doing. And a lot of that friction will just magically evaporate. I'm fetch almost anything. That's what I just gave away one of JJ's secret sauce. Things that she probably <laughs> no, does with some not of at teams. all. But, uh, but I'm curious, Dan, like in your roles, you know, as you've, as you've been kind of leading in that, in that way, do do you reach that point through cross training internally? Do your do the security because I think for a lot of companies, you know, the, their security um, and especially in the mid market, mid mid market to lower enterprise, their security people are security people who have n- no prior 
technology training, right? So are you bringing people in that had, you know, a background in uh, application development, in networking, in something, in something else, and then teaching them security? Or are you, how do you do that? How do you merge those? You just gave away my biggest secret. Um, So, you know, this, this is something that I've been talking about actually, well, to my dogs, mostly because it's been, you know, since COVID, I really don't get out much. Um, So my dogs are actually experts now too. I could get them to work, but uh, the the secret is uh, what you just said. We have a security shortage. We we have, we have a a few problems in security and I'm just going to lay them out if, if, if you don't mind. One of them is that we don't have good entry level. Uh, you know, we don't it, it, tier one for you know, everybody, you know, tier one for the SOC, great place to bring people into the security organization. Guess what? That's mostly being outsourced and or automated away with, with SOAR product, right? So tier one's gone. So now you're at tier two. Well, tier two, you need, you know, people that can do a little bit of threat hunting and, and know the lay of the land, right? So now you do need like the three to five years experience. And I can't think of another area in security where you can take somebody off the street and just drop them in without any prior knowledge, you know, just maybe a, an education degree and just say, OK, be be productive now. Right. Um, not saying that 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 can't be done. And, you know, honestly, it is done every day. A lot of companies have to do that because that's the only option they have. Um, but but we don't have a good entry level and we don't have a good pipeline for the entry level. Right. You know, so so getting kids in college, I always get asked about, you know, can can we do some sort of of internship? And I said, absolutely. But but I don't know what to do with them exactly. Right. And so um, and and, and actually we did have some things and reporting is a great place to get some of those people started. Right. And and training them on on what's important and how to pull reports together. And then they from there, they can learn the different parts of security and what a vulnerability is and why it's important to report it in a timely fashion, especially for the fours and fives, things like that. But once again, that's, but that's a, you know, that's taking a teaspoon and trying to fill the ocean, right? That's, that's not going to solve the problem. So what I've done is I really don't, I tell the recruiters that, that I have to work with, uh, I don't want security person per se, right? If I can find somebody with that five to 10 years experience that, that has worked in another place in security, um, you know, sure. But if you're having trouble finding that, and they always do, at least in the last couple of years, security is just this amazingly hot place. Um, then let's go look for some sys admins for if you're if you know for for infrastructure, right? Let's go look for some network admins that you know for for network security. They know where the bodies are buried. They know how the things are built, right? So I can't think of better people to help break the things or protect the things than the people who know how they run. Um, and, you know, because teaching security it. It's intuitive to most folks, right? The security doesn't happen because once again, there's a mis- misalignment of, of uh, uh, incentives, right? Their incentive is to be productive, to get the system working and to have the least obstacles or problems possible, right? And unfortunately, security products cause problems, cause blockages and outages and things like that. So let's just not put that on there and just have the system work, right? And then you can put a firewall out on the internet and I don't care, right? Um, But they also know how to do the security. They just chose not to because they didn't have the incentive to do the security. Yeah. Right. I feel like we should swing this the other way because I, 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 you know, made the comment and I do feel that these systems have gotten more complex over time. And maybe there's some value in, you know, getting (laughs) getting the manufacturing community and the vendors to to roll that back a little bit. But then. Given your background, I think we have to, uh, I'm curious on your thoughts of some of the the issues with legacy systems. And we've seen, you know, some airlines and FAA and even railway issues happening. What's, what's your thought on the opposite end of this spectrum of complexity? Well, I wish I'd filled that with vodka. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, it's, I think it's an endemic problem. That does not have an easy solution. And, and so legacy systems were very vertically aligned, right? So nowadays we talk a lot about horizontal scaling and, you know, we can scale up and down and, um, and, and do things like that. But um, where, where we end up is we end up with these monolithic single purpose systems that we built that are really robust and they... Uh, can stand the test of time, but unfortunately, time moves on, and you know. So now you have this mainframe with co- code that was written when you know my grandfather was still 
uh, you know, working an active life. And it makes, you know, and it makes for a tough decision for a company because what's going to happen is you go to the, the project manager, you know, they say, oh, we need to update the system. We need to go to DevOps. We need to be cloud fast, whatever, right? Just buzzword, buzzword, go. And they're going to come back with like $8 million, $20 million, you know, project over five years that will be incredibly expensive, disruptive, and time consuming and, and soak up resources because you need the best people, right? You need the SMEs that keep the system running to actually be on the project. So who's now running the system, right? Assuming that they all had full-time jobs and were doing their job anyway, right? So, so now you got this big problem of this huge bogey of a budget item, and you've got this huge timeline and a ton of risk and disruption. Or let's just pay, you know, IBM extra money every year to maintain ZOS, that version of ZOS. And let's just, you know, keep things moving, right? And we'll just keep it uh, the way it was. Shh, 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 don't touch, you know, and, and we can put a, a layer in front of it. We'll put an abstraction layer in front of it for the for the code stuff. And so we'll have a ton of ETL where, you know, the mainframe will puke out some COBOL output and then, you know, we'll get a script and we'll turn that into uh, into JavaScript and shoot that out to the API for the, for the web, uh, for the website. I think that was and my then, COBOL code that did that. Yeah. I, I, I still remember uh, having to write a COBOL uh, program for my final exam in one of my um, uh, college courses by hand. And it was like 18 pages. It was not a simple problem. Um, you know, <laughs> section <Verbose> one. <laughs> so well, we're we're probably going to need to wrap here. <laughs> we, you know, there's so many things, JJ, that I can think of that we could have Dan back for. Um, I'd love to you know, pursue kind of the DevOps angle and you know, sort of how that's also becoming the network, if you will. You know, expanding with these whole with new architectures and software. And we can also talk about like how do you manage your startup vendors who want just enough security to get by, but really need a lot more um, and five other things. So <laughs> we'll definitely have to have you back. If you'll come, if you'll have us, Dan. Oh, absolutely. We'd love to have you back. <laughs> this, was, this, this was therapy, man. I'm, I'm feeling better. <laughs> Good for all of us. Good for all of us. I know, JJ, kind of parting thought, you think, as we wrap things up with Dan? I mean, my takeaway from this is to answer the question of what's bugging you for Dan. I think it's everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's so much more. And I mean, we've had, you know, the the last pass breach, we had key pass has a, a major vulnerability, which is common in a lot of enterprises. We've got a lot of the federal agencies, you know, we're like all all of the different acronyms of federal agencies are um experiencing challenges currently. So there's so much more to talk. I think you have such great perspectives on these things. And I'd definitely like to hear more. Anytime. Let me know. All righty. Well, thank you everybody for joining us on behalf of JJ and Dan. Dan, thank you also uh, for being here with you. It's been a pleasure and we look forward to seeing everybody on a next episode of CISO Talk. You can get us via podcast. I know Dan's not a big podcast listener, but everybody else can go to CISOTalkPodcast.com as well as find out, find the video. There you go. As well as find the video on uh, techstrong.tv. So wait, you have to hold them up. Get it. Get, there you go. There we are. <laughs> We're all NASA fans. <laughs> we found, we found the point to end the show on. All right. Take care, everybody. We will see you soon. Oh. Thanks so much. <laughs>